Hi, everybody, and welcome back to OMN Insights. My name is Soriti Kadia. I'm your host, and today we're going to be continuing our conversation about the uh, changing and evolving political crisis that Ethiopia is facing. And to have uh, this conversation today, we are joined by Professor Ezekiel Gebisa, an author and political analyst. Thank you so much for making the time to be with us today, Professor Ezekiel. Thanks for having me. Um, so we'll get straight into it. Ethiopia has been a consistently and rapidly changing political landscape for the last five years. If we count from the year of the EPRDF's fall and the beginning of Abiy's tenor, or even longer, if we count the years that the state was experiencing the Addis Ababa uh, master plan resistance and the subsequent grassroots political revolution and national movement that grew from it. Now, over the last five years alone, there have been large scale wars in multiple parts of the country, including Oromia, Tigray, the Amhara region and Afar. And this is on top of uh, southern and east eastern parts of Oromia and much of Tigray uh, facing extreme famine and amidst the continued experience of state violence across parts of Oromia and other parts of the country. This includes extra judicial killings and arbitrary arrests and detention that have been uh, quite thoroughly documented. Now the list could go on as the challenges facing Ethiopia are numerous and multifaceted but the question in my summarizing this context is what have been, in your view, Professor Ezekiel, the key influencing, influencing factors that have pushed the country into this dire position? And what about Ethiopia must fundamentally change to see uh, these political conditions shift for the better? Yeah, um, I think the factors that, that triggered the conflict, the ongoing conflicts, which I refer to as a civil war, um, at least since November the 2nd, the Tigray conflict had um, ended with a negotiated um, uh, end, but uh, um, the country is in, in a civil war. Uh, basically, as just mentioned, in many parts of the country, the all regions in the country are experiencing multi-dimensional crises, uh, including uh, conflict. I think people would say that this is a ideological conflict uh, between uh, the new um, incumbents in office and the old uh, feder federalists, that mm -hmm. this is a, a conflict between political forces that attempt to restore a unitary state with a centralized power at the helm. And uh, another position is that it is a, a federation, a federation and de decentralized power. I don't see it that way. I think it is a failure. What led to this civil war or conflict all around the country is not just an ideological uh, uh, conflict, but it's a deeply rooted uh, problem in Ethiopian history. Mm -hmm. I think this is basically a failure of three things. Uh, the first one is the state building effort that started after the conquest um, had gone through many iterations, many ways to try to create a, a, a state, to build a state, to create a nation uh, under the imperial system of uh, Menelik and Haile Selassie. That obviously did not work. The dirt came with the centralized uh, approach to power, uh, exercising power at the center, but allowing uh, some form of regional autonomy in areas where there was a, a centrifugal uh, tendencies. It's a limited recognition that the country had a problem of state building uh, or nation building or governing a multinational empire. Mm. Uh, the EPRDF, especially those uh, forces that were on the margin, whether that was a TPLF, uh, EPLF and OLF, they won the conflict with the Derg in 1991 and put in place the structure uh, that would probably uh, would have accommodated the needs of the, the different nations in the country. But because of the poverty of the country or maybe the insecurity of um, those who who uh, who climbed to the helm of power, mm -hmm. they they made a mistake at the beginning uh, not to implement the the two important issues. Devolve, devolve power to the nations to rule, to rule themselves. Mm -hmm. But for economic reasons, for all other reasons, the, the structure was put in place, a constitution that accommodates the needs of, 
uh, nationalities were put in place, but it was not implemented. And that led to a protest. So basically the state building effort that started with the conquest of the Southern regions um, ended in failure or the, the first failure, the failure of state building or nation building in the country. And these are really concurrent processes uh, in the country. So that's the first one. Mm. Is the, fa the failure of uh, the Federation, not because of the design, but because of a mistake that was made in 1991 in creating the, the so-called the Amhara state. At the time, there was no ethnic group or a nation, they call it in the Ethiopian constitution, a nation that claimed to be Abhara in 1991. As a matter of fact, most people who now pass for Amhara were arguing at that time that they're not Amhara, that there is no ethnic group Amhara, called Amhara, that all have become Ethiopians. Um, but uh, the designers of the, the constitution and the federation actually created a, an Amhara state uh, where the constitution actually required that this sovereignty, the regional sovereignty, the co-sovereignty with the federation should be granted only to nations. Mm -hmm. So the Amhara region was um, one unit of the federation that was designed simply to counterbalance the larger Oromia states. That was another mistake, the failure of the federation at the very start. And the third is what what was attempted in 2018. And that was to, to democratize the federation that remained centralized and the economic uh, injustices that were uh, perpetrated under that system. So the demand of the Oromo protest and other uh, youth led protests in the country was meant to uh, democratize the federation. But instead of continuing on the path of democratization, the prosperity party chose to go back uh, to mm -hmm. return Ethiopia to imperial system of administration, to uh, do away with institutional autonomy, but re-centralize power, basically taking uh, the country back to the imperial uh, period. So these three failures, the failure of state building, the failure of the federal design, and the failure of the uh, democratization process actually led to uh, conflagration, conflict everywhere. So the way uh, I, I want to conceive it is not it's not an ideological conflict. What led to the in instability, um, economic chaos, the hollowing out of the military, the uh, uh, failure of diplomacy, uh, and the civil war is basically the failure of these long-term processes. Do you think, um, thank you for that insight, Professor Ezekiel. Do you think that Ethiopia can avoid state fracture in trying to resolve all of these uh, uh, parallel political conflicts? And can it do so without talking about the past or addressing these historical grievances? Well, we've done that uh, in the past. Is it possible is your question. I think in 1991, there was a political settlement. There was a constitution that uh, for the nation of nations as one of the de designers at that time called it, uh, Dr. Fasil Naum wrote a book, he said, a constitution for the nation of nations. Now, if acknowledgement past injustices, uh, uh, historical injustices is meant to uh, address uh, the problems of the nationalities in the country, the question of equality, well, the constitution was the right design, mm -hmm. the correct design to accommodate the question of the nationalities but also uh, ensure economic and social justice in the country. There was a constitution. There is no problem with the design, including the, uh, the famous Article 39, which actually um, granted the right, not exercised right, but declared right, the right to self-determination up to and including secession. Mm -hmm. That ensured the centrifugal tendencies in the country like the Oromo Liberation Front, the Ogaden Liberation Front, they were okay with, with that, ha that right being de uh, so, um, declared possible in the constitution. They had abandoned, and for the 30 years, abandoned their, uh, their uh, demand for self-determination, including uh, uh, secession. Uh, and in the th 30 years, even under the system uh, of the P APRDF, because political centralization did not lead to prevention 
of uh, cultural autonomy and a cultural renaissance, mm. th there was a, a certain degree of autonomy to, to build the nation. What I mean by that is, for instance, the Oromo nation before 1991 was, was um, divided. Uh, the languages were almost unintelligible. But uh, in the period of uh, the EPRDF in the 90s and, um, and, and 2000, the Oromo and other peoples of the South uh, experienced some sort of uh, cultural renaissance, which actually led to the creation or the recreation or the rebirth of uh, the Oromo nation. And that applies to all nations in, in the country. So all, all was not lost. So the constitution was a design. The political settlement was what Ethiopia needed at the time. And of course, actually prevented Ethiopia from disintegrating in 1991. Um, so is there a, a, a formula for uh, overcoming the uh, multidimensional crisis that the country is uh, experiencing? At the heart of it is a political problem. Uh, right now, after genocide, it has become very difficult. That means mm. the political settlement of 1991 itself might not be workable at this point in time. But there is no choice that um, some kind of uh, a repeat of 1991, where all interest groups and all nationalities and all political uh, forces sit down to craft another political settlement in the aftermath of genocide everywhere in the country. So mm -hmm. even the federation that I said had prevented conflict for the last three decades in the country actually ended up in uh, uh, a genocidal war uh, because of the resistance against uh, the centralizing tendencies of the prosperity party. What is needed is goodwill. It's not that there is no uh, solution to it. Ethiopia's problem is not indissoluble. It is possible to resolve it. It's mm -hmm. the goodwill. It's the goodwill that the country uh, and all political forces are committed to resolving the issue on the basis of mutual understanding, mutual recognition, mutual respect, and the willingness to address the problems head on. Mm -hmm. So sure, it's possible that um, uh, uh, at the point, the, at this point in time, the well is really poisoned. Uh, mm -hmm. The social and cultural ties that uh, the country the, that existed uh, among the, the nations of the country is frayed. Uh, and there is a lot of bad blood at this point in time. Yeah, Th thank you so much for that insight, uh, Professor Ezekiel. Moving our conversation on a little bit of a different direction, although you raised uh, or, or you alluded towards this part of the conversation and, uh, and to this point in the second point you raised and the three points that you gave as to what the problem is in Ethiopia. Um, for some background, according to a statement released by the Ormo Legacy Leadership and Advocacy Association on the 22nd of December, this is last year, this is quote from the, uh, from the statement, on November 25th and 29th, 2022, Residents reported that Fano killed several individuals during attacks in Kiremo District, East Walaga Zone, including a Kiremo District Court judge. The Gidda Ayana District Government's Communications Office issued a statement claiming that the entire population of 19 villages in Kiremo had been displaced due to the violence. Um, there are a number of other reports of attacks by Fano militia in the same uh, areas of Walaga and also other parts of Oromia. Um, and Fano was also one of the key factors in the, uh, or the key actors, sorry, in the Tigray genocide. Um, you mentioned uh, the Amhara political identity in your second point in the first answer uh, about how the designation of a state, uh, a federal state uh, for the Amhara was a mistake. So I'm curious to understand if the Amhara, you know, do not adopt a, a national identity that is centered around Amhara-ness or the Amhara regional state, and are rather opt for the, you know, the Ethiopian identity as their sort of uh, uh, their their uh, staple in terms of their political identity, how does that help us solve our problem in terms of an Ethiopian-ness that is based on this one identity founded in this very linear uh, history of Ethiopia? Um, that's one part of the question that I derived from your response earlier, but also if you can let us into or give us some insight on what the political ambitions or motivations of this militia group are and what you think it's driving ideologies, political ideologies uh, could be. Um, I think they're, they're related. I think everything that you just raised are all related. Um, 
Um, the, the question of Amhara, Amhara identity um, in the last 30 years, especially since the ascendancy of uh, Abiy Ahmed and the Prosperity Party to power, Amhara nationalism, and that is my point, Amhara nationalism has risen. If in 1991 they did not create a state where there was no Amhara nationalism, and this is not what I am saying, it's what, the, what uh, Ethiopian politicians at the time were saying. I remember the discussion between uh, Professor Mesfin Waldemariam uh, and Melis Zenawi, where the one that should have that that should have <laughs> passed for an Amhara identity, Professor Mesfin was arguing that there is no Amhara identity, there is no Amhara uh, uh, as as a separate ethnic group, and the Tigrayan Melis Zenawi was uh, arguing that there was uh, an Amhara identity. I think they both were speaking from their respective visions for the country and their political goals. But uh, uh, because the Amhara state, regional state was created within that cauldron, within that um, uh, political space, an Amhara nation or an Amhara ethnic group was born. But this Amhara ethnic group was born out of deep grievances. Mm -hmm. um, and the FANO was created by... Uh, um, the Fano and other uh, paramilitary or militia groups in, in, um, in um, the Amhara region were created right after, right after the, uh, the fall of the, the EPRDF uh, government uh, in 2018. Out of grievances, out of phobia, out of uh, disdain for other ethnic groups, uh, and out of uh, uh, anger for, for, uh, for feeling like their ethnicity was deracinated in, in the 30 years prior or the 27 years prior. So Amhara ethnic ethnic identity was created in the region. Once the political space was created, grievances were created, and Amhara, um, Amhara identity was created in contradistinction uh, mm -hmm. to, to the pressure that was put on them. So the nationalism that emerged in 20, uh, 2018 in the Amhara region uh, exemplified by NAMA, the uh, uh, national uh, association of, or the political party called NAMA or ABIN as in Amharic. That was, that was the, the standard bearer of Amhara nationalism. And this Amhara nationalism was not a positive nationalism that, that, uh, that was uh, claiming what they had lost in the past, mm -hmm. but to return to a position that, that they had lost, a position of dominance, uh, a, a position of control, uh, a per position of hegemony, and a position of imperial expansion. It was an angry, negative nationalism. That's what emerged in the Amhara region. So the mistake that I said was made in 1991 actually produced a very virulent uh, and negative dystopian Amhara nationalism that has become the source of conflict, the source of instability, and the source of uh, political malaise in, in, in that country. Mm -hmm. So what you see in northern uh, Wallaga, what used to be northern Wallaga, in the areas that you mentioned, in Gidda Kiramu, in Gidda Ayana, these are uh, 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 lands that, that have always belonged to the Oromo people. The Oromo people had lived on them at least for 400 years. Mm -hmm. But right now, this virulent Amhara nationalism is claiming that the Oromo people in that, uh, in that region must be removed to make way for the, the reclaiming and resettlement of Amharas there. Mm -hmm. Not only there, by the way, you mentioned the Tigray, the, the role of the Fano in Tigray. What did they do in Tigray? <laughs> they claimed a, a, a chunk of Tigray territory in the west and in the south mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and say, this is, this is ours. So this expansionist, uh, expansionist uh, uh, um, uh, streak of Amhara nationalism and imperialist and almost bordering on fascistic methods is the result of the, the, the mistake that was made in 1991, but it gave us an Amhara nationalism that is claiming, uh, that's claiming land uh, left and right, or, or north and south, mm -hmm. but also telling us these days, I don't know if you understand it, the, the, the discourse in the Amhara circle, which is held in private or in public, they're saying it only the Amhara people are able or capable of 
governing Ethiopia, saving Ethiopia, speaking almost in messianic terms that mm. only the Amhara must rule, otherwise Ethiopia is done. Mm. They oppose mm. every initiative for equality because they are used to uh, hegemonic uh, presence in the Ethiopian political um, uh, uh, body, body mm. politics. So that is basically what, what I, I meant by the rise of Amhara uh, identity, a national and political identity, which gave rise to a, a dystopian uh, nationalism, a negative nationalism, an expansionist nationalism, um, and fascistic tendency, uh, tactics uh, in implementing mm. them that is really uh, uh, roiling the Ethiopia, Ethiopia uh, at this moment. Do you think, Professor Ezekiel, that if uh, groups representing these Amhara nationalistic um, uh, desires or ambitions at the moment were to sit at a negotiating table uh, with members of other leadership groups across the different nat nations and nationalities in Ethiopia, and there was this political will that you were talking about earlier, it was present, and we had gotten to the point of having a conversation about how do we restructure this thing called Ethiopia so that we're all safe and we can all live with dignity and we're all happy. Do you think that there is anything uh, that could satisfy this level of political um, ambition or this kind of th this political expansionism is really, I think, what you're talking about, what you're describing. Is, is there any way to satisfy that at a negotiating table? If so, what could that even begin to look like? Well, here, here is the problem, uh, uh, Soretti. The problem is that like in the nationalist circles, at least the one that I know best in, in the Oromo uh, political discourse, we have always said it is imp impossible to democratize an empire. It's impossible to democratize um, a, an empire without decolonization. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the, the problem. As long as as long as the Amhara feel that they are the ones that are uh, divinely ordained to rule Ethiopia, there is no point in having a discussion. Mm -hmm. If you oppose equality, and that's basically what the Oromo demand is, the Oromo demand, the Sima demand, the Afwar demand is to be equal, mm. to become citizens. They were subjects in an empire. They now want to become a citizen of a state and enjoy the rights that uh, anyone is um, available to anyone. The rights that are available to anyone should be available to all is what... Mm. Uh, but if the, the discourse from the Amhara side is that we're the saviors, we are the civilizers, we are the creators of the state, and every one of you, uh, like they're saying this day, for instance, the Somali are nomads, the Oromo are nomads, nomadic people. They do not know the art of uh, the, the state statecraft. That's why we are in this position. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that are roiling the body politic, and they are now turning around and blaming the Oromo uh, for for uh, 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 for, for the events uh, or the the, the quagmire mm -hmm. that we are in at this moment, and saying that the Oromo the Oromo are are nomadic people who do not know how to rule. They're uh, 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 newcomers uh, who are not uh, members of members of the, the the country who cannot become. Uh, citizens. So if, if they are newcomers, they are settlers, then there is no point in, in really having a common uh, conversation. And the other uh, problem is not just the, the political demands. If we do not agree on facts, mm -hmm. if you do not agree on facts, how could you have a conversation? Mm -hmm. Today, in the areas that you just mentioned, in Gidda Kiramu, Kiramu, for instance, the whole, uh, the whole district was emptied of its its residents, and then they say, those who are perpetrating this egregious, heinous uh, uh, crimes are mm -hmm. saying that the Amhara are being killed. They kill mm -hmm. Oromos, and then they say the Amharas are killed. So if you don't have a shared understanding, if you don't under, uh, agree on facts, is it possible to have a conversation? This is the, like a post-fact world where a conversation is uh, impossible, but there is a silver lining. The rest of Ethiopia, 90% of Ethiopia, from Tigray counterclockwise to Kemant, mm. we do not have a problem living mm. together, working together, mm. talking to each other. 
we have the same history of oppression and we have the same kind of, kind of unity of purpose in what we want. In that area, in all of this area, conversation is possible. The difficulty is the Amhara area where, where like I just said, you kill and then, and then declare that Amharas were killed in, in Wallaga and therefore they have to incorporate in Wallaga into, into um, uh, the Amhara region mm. or Mate or uh, uh, Western Tigray or, or Raya or other, uh, uh, the Eastern part of, uh, uh, of Shawa, Eastern Shawa. Mm. Mm. All of these areas they're claiming it's, it's that's what makes the discourse, the conversation for political settlement uh, difficult. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that very detailed and insightful answer, Professor Ezekiel. Coming towards the end of our conversation, on the, tw on the 16th of February 2023, the president of the Oromia Regional State, Shamela Sabdisa, called on the Ole OLF to sit for peace talks whilst addressing the sixth regular meeting of Chaffe Oromia, the regional council. The OLA did respond by stating in a press release that, quote, any call for resolution of the war on Oromia through civilized discourse is therefore welcome news, but that the, and again, quote, call for peace lacks the requisite clarity and nuance to be too optimistic about the overtures of an imminent peace process in Oromia. Moreover, on the 28th of March, the OLA issued a press release in response to the Ethiopian Prime Minister's remarks in Parliament regarding dialogue between the two parties. The statement says that the, quote, regime deployed several local mediation committees to persuade individual OLA officers to surrender, which ultimately resulted in failure. What are the most pressing challenges, in your view, Professor Iskiel, in beginning a peace process between the OLA and the Ethiopian government? To be honest, there shouldn't be any. Because what the OLA is demanding for uh, the Oromo people is constitutional. Only constitutional demands uh, rights that are enshrined in the Ethiopian constitution. Second, what the OLA and the Oromo people demand, uh, their demands are very consistent with the international instruments of human rights, international covenants of, uh, of, 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 uh, of human rights. They're consistent, they're legitimate, they're constitutional, and they are not uh, ambitious. That I mean, what I mean by that is that uh, Oromo is not demanding what, what they do not deserve, and what they hadn't had uh, in the past. It's only simply to, to govern, to self-govern, to self-rule, to have the right, the cultural right to speak their own language, uh, uh, grow their uh, culture and define their own identity. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, economic justice. Why would this be a problem for the Ethiopian government? So if the Ethiopian government is willing to uh, to end the conflict with, a, with negotiations and a political settlement, there is nothing that stops it from doing so. The very genesis of the conflict in Oromia is the fact that the Oromo protest movement, which, which, uh, which lasted from 2015 to 2018, which actually made it possible for the rise of Abiy Ahmed to power, they had clear demands. I was just talking about it, that they had absolutely clear demands, political rights, economic rights, and cultural rights. And like I just said, these are not, uh, these are not um, uh, marginal issues. These are mm. central, not to Ethiopia alone, but to all peoples around the world. Mm. So this was, the, the Oromo uh, cause was betrayed. The demands were, uh, the promises that were made were reneged. I could speak this in macro terms and micro terms, but in mm. general, the demands that were legitimate and constitutional uh, 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 were turned out to be, a, uh, were made to be a, uh, a demand for a disintegration of, of the country, even though they are constitutional in the Ethiopian constitution. So there is really no 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 problem if the Ethiopian government has the willingness to mm. to govern according to the constitution of Ethiopia and according to international instruments of human rights there should be no problem. Mm. But on the OLA side there is 
there is a, a legitimate grievances against the Ethiopian state. Mm. In 1991, the OLA was part of the political settlement. The o o o o OLF, OLF leaders were the designers of the constitution and the federation. They participated in it, and then they were ejected out of the political realm. Second, in 2018, and I, I'm just abbreviating it, in 2018, when the OLF returned to the country to conduct peaceful uh, political uh, activity, um, it was one of the last, and there was what they called the unsigned Asmara Agreement, an eight-point agreement. And the, the OLA was supposed to be um, integrated into the Ethiopian uh, military or police or or become a, a joint civilian life. There was a clear way of doing that, the DDR uh, that the United Nations had developed. But the Ethiopian government, uh, instead of uh, doing what it was supposed to do, instead of living up to its obligation, uh, it also reneged on its promises. And um, the OLA was driven back to um, armed struggle. Mm. So if the Ethiopian government wants to end this, uh, based on the Ethiopian constitution, there isn't a problem. But because of the lack of trust, the OLA is demanding that there should be a third party. And this third mm. party must not only be neutral, but also capable. Capable, for instance, of, of uh, uh, logistically re uh, uh, getting the negotiators to a neutral area and also um, uh, have some uh, leverage on the Ethiopian government to make sure the Ethiopian government lives up to its own obligation. Mm -hmm. That's what they're demanding. And once they sit down uh, and uh, agree on modalities of uh, conducting the negotiations, I think the constitution should be the basis. Uh, uh, it's uh, like I was saying er earlier, that has become frayed at this point in time, but the constitution could be the basis for resolving the, the problem in Oromia as well. It's all the, the ball is in the in the court of the Ethiopian government. In my judgment, I don't think the Ethiopian government is ready uh, to live uh, to live by the constitution um, that is on the books uh, in Ethiopia. Very interesting and poignant analysis, Professor Ezekiel. I thank you so much for making the time to join us for this conversation today. Anytime. Thanks for having me. Well, everybody, I hope that you found that conversation uh, to be as beneficial uh, and insightful as I did. I definitely learned uh, a couple very new things um, and also yeah, found a lot of the articulations that Professor Ezekiel gave uh, to be succinct uh, and uh, honestly accurate in many ways. Uh, you are watching Omen Insight. My name is Soriti Kadia, and I look forward to joining you again next week.